have some other questions, but I don't want to take so much time from the audience. So my question is to Armin, uh, basically. So you're, you're selling this concept of decentralized governance. I, I, can, I can buy the arguments, but it's a nice dream, I think. Um, my question to you is, uh, this is derived also from experience with current deployments such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and others. The protocols are decentralized. They give you a way to decentralize things, but the deployment is not. So currently, if you count the people that can control these systems, it's a handful of people. And I don't understand why me, as a person, I would go and actually rely on mining pools operators in China and US and other, whatever, and some developers to regulate my currency, my whatever, instead of relying on officials that I elect personally, that actually have the relevant degrees and so on. So the question is, why would I do that? Um, if you, to put it really bluntly, um, if you prefer credibility, so a degree on their wall, um, in order to be able to trust their currency, then that's a different conversation as a whole. I would prefer a currency that cannot be repeated, that cannot be printed out at demand. I would prefer a currency that cannot be inflated as it is right now with the euro, US dollars. That there is no consensus between the people that use the currency and the people that choose to print more of it. That there is no consensus between the value and the population that actually uses it. So regardless of who is in control of it, which you say is a handful of people, which in a essence it is correct, but those handful of people are powered by hundreds of thousands of miners. They don't operate at their own will. Um, so it's distributed power actually, and they operate in such a way where the power is actually distributed at the max. 25% um, is the max of one pool hosting the power, and you need more than 51% of the network. That's two mining. That's two people, or two mining facilities containing a lot of mining power. It's You know how these things operate. Yeah. It's two people. Well, why would they do that? Why would they harm a network that provides them millions of dollars per month? What I'm asking you is why would I want to join it? That's the question. Why would you want to join it? It's a generic problem. So, so I think I'm sympathetic, but, but I think the generic problem with the sort of underdeveloped teenage pseudo libertarianism you get from the sort of Bitcoin side of things is that the problem is essentially with democracy. And it's a, it's a disgusting kind of elitism. So it says you can use Bitcoin to evade Argentinian capital controls, right? Which is true. And that's fantastic. But what that's really saying is we don't like what the democratically elected government does, so we're going to ignore it. What is their democracy? It's, that's the wrong question to ask. <laughs> okay. you're, 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 if you're saying, I don't like what the government does, so therefore I should be allowed to ignore it, just say that. Don't, don't dress it up in the sort of pretend technological terms. And if you're going to claim to me that that's not a form of elitism, I think you're a liar. It's, it's just a different kind of elitism. And it's a very, very disturbing kind of elitism. So it's saying, I don't like your rules, I don't have to follow them. And there's something wrong with that, I agree. Would you like to respond to that? Oh, that? absolutely. <laughs> I, th I think it's very hard. Like, I don't, there was no need to... Um, you know, call me a liar on that aspect because it's not my concept, it's a decentralized concept. Yeah, but are you saying it's not a form of elitism? Absolutely not. Well, then you are a liar because it is. <laughs> okay. Well, we if, can be honest with each other about it. Okay, if we're going to be honest, okay. if, let's be honest. Okay. I'm happy to be honest. Do you feel there is democracy at the moment? Why was Uber Look, banned, for example? I'm not if in there was of letting vote. I'm very much against letting the general public vote on anything. Okay. So, so you know, I'm, but the thing is, they do, and I have to abide by the rules, and that's how life works. But there is no democracy. It's not saying. because I'm a billionaire or because I have access to some technology shouldn't allow me just to ignore those rules. It's that's just wrong. Okay, I think we need to go on to this discussion later on. So let's take up something else. So we have one question here, and then one more here. Thanks. A uh, question for Jürgen. Uh, personal experiences, at least two banks have information on me, except they don't have information on me, because this information was given by criminals to set up accounts in my name. So it's, well, it's, I suppose it's a new kind of quantum computing, isn't it? This information that's about me and not about me at the same time. Uh, do I have any rights to that information? Hmm, that's a very interesting case. <laughs> um, 
Well, I think, yes, you do have rights. Of course, you can file an access request no? to the bank, and you can say, well, I want to know what kind of data you hold about me, and they will have to provide you with a copy of the data set. And that may or may not include the data that was generated by, by these criminals. Huh? I mean, I think it probably is likely that it will be included, right? Because that's your current that's the current information the bank has about you. Huh? It's, it's about meta me. It's not me. Is it? I, I, well, I, well, well, it will be. It will be. Obviously, it has to be. It has to be tied to you as a person, right? So all your, your normal customer data that the bank had, the bank has, obviously, will be included. Anything the bank has been doing with the data in terms of sharing it compiling it, um, maybe adding other information, and there we go again. Uh, maybe this will be included. So yes, yes, I mean, someone internally will obviously check, you know, that they don't compromise an investigation with the public prosecutor and so on. Of course, they will, yeah. But yes, you can file an access request, and you have rights. I, I personally know someone who had some mobile phone contracts taken out in his name by some identity thieves. And he felt this is in the UK. He phoned up the mobile operator to say, you know, this isn't me. Uh, but I'm not receiving these bills anyway, so where, where are the bills being sent to? And they said, we can't tell you because of data protection, because you just told us that it's not you, so we can't tell you where the bills are being sent to. So he hung up and waited half an hour and then phoned back pretending to be himself in order to find out where the bills are being sent to. So what you need to do is to phone up and pretend to be yourself, and then that way you can find out where the information is going. And, and just to add to that, you of course have not only the right to access, but also to, to have your data corrected. Right? So that in that example, um, you have the right to have, have your data corrected. You can't change anything on the blockchain, so you can't. Well, okay, it. that's a specific. I mean, you know, you see the legal framework is far behind. I mean, this took five years to negotiate and to come up with this legal framework, and, and it's already it's already outdated. Right? So that's the problem. We only care for another week. Question, sir, and then one more here. You're picking people. At the far ends of the room, aren't you? On purpose. I'd like to keep you right. Yes. Uh, Dave, a question for you. Uh, uh, f f first of all, thank you for the very inspiring talks. Uh, I really enjoy listening to you guys. Uh, I was inspired by your saying that, uh, that you're happy to uh, spend another $500 on a washing machine, recognizing these, uh, recognizing your palm. And, and stuff like that. And, and I was wondering, the next thing that is going to happen is that these chips are being stuck in and you have your own contracts, uh, your own smart contract for your, for your pants. And um, the question really is whether or not the future is going to be like that wash, washing machines are going to be more expensive and I have to learn how to manage the smart contracts for my pants, but not just my pants, also my shirts and my socks. I, and they may be very I different. I, I and whether or not it is cheaper to just buy a zapper and just get rid of the chip and learn how to do my washing. <laughs> I've tried that, I can tell you. That's, that's not a realistic part. Um, so I think, I think it's a very good question. I don't think it'll quite be like that, because I, I actually think what Amin was saying, which is about this pressure for decentralization, is actually true. So despite the making fun, you know, the technological core of what he's saying is correct. Right? But um, that doesn't match up with the, the sort of human reality of it. So I, I, I want my pants to be managed properly, but I personally don't want the responsibility of having to look after the private keys and manage them and form the contracts, whatever. That part of it won't happen. So the question, so so some bodies will will do that for, me. and so the question is, are those emergent properties of the network, which if you're a twenty-year-old MIT computer programmer, you this is what you want, but I think in the in the real world for people like me, I will download those policies from some trusted third party. So I, I won't manage the pants myself. I, I will look for people who have the right smart contracts to do it for me. And if I choose whoever, you know, the Consumers Association or something, I'll choose theirs. So first you don't manage your washing, then you step up by doing contracts, and then you're not going to manage the contracts and outsource it to people. How are you going to select all these people for all these contracts? Or are you going to also look out for people that can select these guys for you and then 
this goes on and on and on. Well, the Mint didn't problem. mention, so, so one of the most attractive aspects of this more decentralized economy, uh, I think, is the transition to sort of reputation-based transactions, which is something that has been discussed at email before. So I, I can well believe it's a version of the future where I buy the pants and I choose the smart contract on a reputational basis. So perhaps it's the Consumers Association or perhaps it's some celebrity or what, I don't know. But I, I'm really, I really doubt I will manage my pants myself. Um, I will get the smart contract from a you know what I mean, like that yeah, reputation you know, aspect of it. Yeah, systems that play a very big part. Would, wouldn't it be cheaper to just hire a housekeeper? To well, it would be cheaper just to throw away the pants when they get dirty. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I think we need to go on to the last two questions. So there was one here, and the final one. Yes, I have a, a worry about the data protection. Uh, from the EU, from that uh, new uh, regulation. Uh, you know, doctors said to me they are afraid of putting, uh, for example, information on potential child abuse, uh, information for a parent in the data file, because the parent could go to the file and just delete that information. Is that correct? I'm not sure I understand. So explain that well, scenario again. So you have I, a doctor, if doctor, I'm a physician, a general practitioner, and I suspect this uh, situation of child abuse. Mm. I put that in the fag, but I can't put it in the fag actually because the parent can go and see what's in the fag and have it deleted. Have that information about child abuse being deleted. Is that correct? Well. The, um, the doctor also has professional secrecy requirements huh? and under under different types of laws and regulations he needs to observe. So if, if he feels there is a case like that, um, of course he has to be very careful what kind of information he puts in there and there's other organizations he can turn to if there's a sus suspicion like that. Huh? I mean, I, I don't think he can, um, parents will, will, I mean, this also depends on what's happening. If parents are going to go and check the file every week, if, if the child is, is under it's a treatment. Case. I mean, but you uh, have to notify the parents if you change it, right? You just told me. You have to be notified of any changes, right? Well, what, what do you mean notify of changes? Well, if you, if you, if you have new yeah. information that, that you're looking after, you're now, the, you're now processing some new information, you have to tell the yeah. person, right? I mean, you can, yeah. as, a, as a client, or as a patient, you can manage the data in, that are on you, and if so, if there's all sorts of information which may be useful, for example, for child protection issues, and you can just delete it because it's not convenient. That's bizarre. Yeah, so, but that's not that's not what's, well, that's not allowed under professional secrecy rules. That the doctor has to has to be subject to, in addition to data protection. That's all. That's going to be a question between two different kinds of laws: one data protection right. and other laws, which can make comment. But, but, there, but there's a more general thing about crime yeah. prevention. Right. So, if I'd suggest you take it offline after this, because sure. we're going to take too much to time mention. to go into all the details mm -hmm. here. And we take a very last question. Dan? Whereabouts? Yeah. Yeah. Um, ah, right. I'm not doing this on purpose. Well. I've got a quick question for, for Dave while I'm walking. Um, his pants theory, does this open up a new lot of biometrical information? Well, I was hoping my pants would be exempted from all of this, but it turns out if my pants contain any genetic or health-related data, which I fear they might, uh, then they have to have a data protection officer appointed to them. <laughs> This is all looking like Brexit to me, <laughs> but there's actually a definition for my biometric data as well now in the regulation. I didn't talk about this, but there is a definition for biometric data, a legal definition. It's very funny. Then. Um, um, I'm Dan Feldhaus. Uh, I just want to, uh, to ask one question to Jorg and, and also to give you uh, insight in the question that was raised about blockchain. Tomorrow there is a nice uh, workshop, and I have here the program, and it's also on the reception. So if you want to see who are the speakers and some interesting continued discussions on that. It's, I would uh, advise you to have a look at it. That's here? Um, it's in The Hague, uh, the security delta, so it's not in the same. <laughs> yeah. keep, uh, on, keep on talking. Just and uh, your the question from, um, uh, if, if there are multiple persons involved, <laughs> yeah. um, and you, they want to delete the data of an incident or something else, and that is actually being stored by the government because they want to 
look on his uh, citizens. How is that going to treat this? Are different conflicting rules apply there? Well, I think the, the way we didn't talk about this in detail, of course, you, you have the right to have data deleted, but of course it needs to be justified, right? So the moment justification doesn't work and the, the, the organization receiving the request for deletion will have to check that that's the responsibility of the organization. If they say, well, this deletion is not justified because, I don't know, there's, a, there's an investigation going on, there's a, there's a criminal background, then of course um, this will not happen, right? And there's, other, there's exemptions in the law when this right uh, to have data deleted will not apply. Okay, then uh, thank you very much and thanks once again for the speakers who are very lively and controversial um, session. And we didn't have the blockchain here in place already to achieve consensus, but that we'll be looking at in the future. So thank you, uh, thank you very much, and thank you for your questions as well. But before you leave, um, I'd just like to point out that those who are TDL members, that there's going to be at 1 o'clock in room 3.8 upstairs, the General Assembly. So please, that's in parallel with lunch, but you will still have time enough to get lunch. We'll have a very quick general assembly, so please make the point to be upstairs at uh, 3 level 8. And thanks once again to the speakers for the excellent talks.